Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church presents Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 11, Sunday, November 15th, 2020. The lesson is entitled, God Judges the Sin. Lesson text comes from Exodus chapter 32, verses 25 through 35. Related scriptures are Psalms 85, 10 through 13, Revelations 21, 22 through 27. The place is Mount Sinai. The time is 1445 B.C. Teaching about judgment on sin is difficult because our fallen human nature colors our viewpoint on the subject. We do not like being indebted to anyone, but we cannot compensate God for the penalty incurred by our sin. God sacrificed his only son for us, which is beyond any price we could ever pay back. We cannot, we cannot pay for our own sin. We cannot even fully understand the price, and nothing a mere human being can do will satisfy God or balance the books. Our sin can only be paid for by the grace of God as freely given by him and on the merits of Christ's saving work on the cross. We cannot save ourselves by our good intentions and deeds. Therefore, when it comes to hard passages that deal with sin and judgment, all we can do is observe God's response and learn from him. We must accept his judgment and look to him for redemption. Today's aim, facts, to see how God judged Israel's sin. Principle, to know that God judges sin and that he alone sees it as it really is. Application, to realize that God sees and judges our sin and to thank him for his priceless gift of salvation in Christ. Illustrating the lesson, sin has fearful consequences. We must be wise and flee to Christ to be set free from judgment. Practical points. One, people are most vulnerable to failure when they are not doing whatever seems right in their own, when they are doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. Exodus 32, 25. Two, standing with God requires separation from the world and hatred of sin, verses 26 through 28. Three, God rewards obedience with greater responsibility, verse 29. Four, godly leaders should grieve over sin because it hurts God and his people, verse 30. Five, God seeks leaders who possess the sacrificial heart of Christ, verses 31 through 32. Six, God is faithful to his promises and he alone is completely just in his judgment. Verses 33 through 35. Golden text. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Exodus 32, 33. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is swift judgment, coming from Exodus 32, 25 through 29. The second is godly intercession, Exodus 32, 30 through 32. And the third is divine declaration, Exodus 32, 33 through 35. <clears throat> Introduction. People who serve in government, elected or otherwise, are often called public servants. That is a good term, for it describes what such people are to do, serve the public. Of course, we are reminded far too often that many so-called public servants are more interested in serving themselves than in actually serving the public. We can understand why some public servants become cynical and start viewing their job as just as a means of earning a paycheck. Serving people is not easy. It means putting up with and sometimes confronting anger, angry, unreasonable, selfish people. And it often means that no matter what the leaders do, half the people are going to hate it and maybe even hate them. Jesus said, the greatest among us are those who serve others, Mark 10, 42 through 45. Those who selfishly seek to serve others are worthy of our prayers, as are all who are in positions of authority, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Their task is difficult and made harder still if we fail to pray for them. Moses was not perfect. 
but he was a selfless leader of a selfish people. As such, he was a model of what we should do, e we should each aspire to, to be. Swift judgment, Exodus thirty-two twenty-five. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Verse 27. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Verse 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Decision. Exodus 32, 25-26. Having been told by the Lord what was happening in the camp of Israel, Moses returned from the mountain to find a tumultuous scene of people dancing in delight before a golden idol. He broke the stone tablets containing God's law, symbolizing the nation's breaking of the covenant with the Lord. He destroyed the idol and then forced the people to ingest the remains of it in their drinking water. This act, of, this act symbolized that the people could not escape the consequences of their sin of making and worshiping the idol. The time for experiencing those consequences had now arrived. As Moses looked out on the rebellious throne, he saw that they were naked. Verse 25. Since the Hebrew word for play back in verse 6 suggests immoral activity, the word for naked here may refer to being unclothed. However, the Hebrew word often simply refers to loosening and could mean that they were running wild and out of control, acting without restraint. Aaron, who had been left in charge of the people, is described as the one who allowed this to happen. As a result of the, of the riotous celebration, the Israelites were shamed among their enemies. This may refer to their vulnerability to attack as well as to the mockery they had become to surrounding peoples. Moses stood at the camp's entrance and called for people to make a decision. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Verse 26. This was a challenge to all who, remind, who, re, who remained faithful to the Lord to publicly identify themselves as such. The result was that the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Moses was from the tribe of Levi, and that tribe now stood by his side. Was his brother Aaron among those who stood with him? It appears that he was, since all the tribe is said to have stood with Moses. We can imagine, though, that Aaron, while repentant, was profoundly embarrassed and humble. This is a reminder that when one person is willing to stand boldly for the Lord, he is likely to find others willing to join him. It is also a sad reminder that had Aaron trusted the Lord and stood up to the rebels, he too may have found support and encouragement. Death, Exodus 32, 27 through 29. Moses' instruction to the Levites gathered by his side was to go through the camp and kill the idolaters. This may strike us as unduly harsh, and certainly we are not called to do anything like this today. But we must keep several things in mind. First, this was not merely Moses' idea as if it were revenge against those who opposed his leadership. Rather, it was the command of the Lord God of Israel, verse 27. This in itself re relieves the moral issue. Since God is holy and all he does and commands is just, right, and holy. Leviticus 11, 44, Psalms 145, 17. Second, the idolaters could not be left in Israel to influence others. 
if the idolatry were allowed to continue, many people in ancient Israel would turn from saving truth to condemning falsehood from the promise of eternal life with God to destruction in hell. And since Israel was the repository of God's saving truth at this time, allowing the idolatry to continue might have affected the potential for eternal life of countless future generations of Israelites and Gentiles alike. Third, the idolaters had condemned themselves, for they had agreed to the covenant which demanded death for anyone who worshipped another god. Exodus 22.20 the Lord ordered the Levites to take their swords and go through the camp and kill the idolaters without discriminating on the base of tribe or personal relationship. 3227. They did as they were instructed. And the text tells us about 3,000 men were killed that day. Verse 28. Out of more than 2 million people, only 3,000 died by the sword that day. On the surface, the instructions appeared to suggest that the Levites were to kill everyone, but their actions, which are described as being according to the word of Moses, make it clear that only a limited number were, were ever targeted for this divinely declared judgment. This raises an interesting question. Why were only 3,000 killed when the whole nation was held accountable for the sin? Verse 30. It is likely the 3,000 represented those who were directly involved in the idolatry. If this was the case, the others, while not participating in the act, stood by and permitted it to take place and were held guilty for that reason. However, they were not put to death by the Levites. It is also possible the Levites acted in a very systematic manner as they went through the camp and determined which of the participants in the idolatry were re unrepentant, and only those 3,000 in total were put to death. Under this view, those who were now sorry for their sin and repented of it were spared execution. This might help explain why, explain not only why the number who died were so few, but also why Aaron was spared. He repented of his actions, Deuteronomy 9.20. However, also tells us that Moses prayed specifically for Aaron to be spared. The Levites' obedience in carrying out the very difficult task of executing their sinful fellow Israelites demonstrated their commitment to the Lord. Moses told them to consecrate themselves to the Lord. <clears throat> that is, they were to dedicate themselves or set themselves apart to his service. Many commentators believe this is a call to the Levites to ordain themselves to the priestly office. This, then, would be the blessing the Lord was bestowing upon them. The Lord had already revealed to Moses that Aaron and his descendants would serve Israel as priests. 27, 21 through 28, 1. But this was unknown to any but Moses at this time. Also in God's plan, the entire tribe of Levi would be set apart to serve the Lord under the direction of the priest in the tabernacle and later the temple. Numbers 8, 6 through 19. Thus Moses' words at least hinted at the special role of the Levites that God would more fully reveal later. Godly intercession, verse 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Pre-adventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. Verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, block me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. Sin acknowledged. Exodus 32, 30-31. <clears throat> when Moses had first been informed of the idolatry in Israel's camp, while he was still on the mountain, he had interceded for the people with the Lord, who threatened to destroy the whole nation and start over with him, verses 9-14. through 14. Moses had argued forcefully that the Lord must spare the people in order to keep his promises and maintain his reputation. 
This was undoubtedly the very response God desired from Moses. Consequently, he withdrew his threat and the people were spared annihilation. The fact that God held back from destroying the nation did not suggest that there would be no consequences for their rebellion. As we saw, 3,000 men died because of their active participation in the idolatry. Now Moses feared more divine judgment would come, and his response was again to intercede with the Lord for his people. A day after the Levites carried out God's directive to kill the offenders, Moses addressed all the people and declared that they had sinned a great sin, verse 30. They too were guilty for having gone along with the idolatry. The whole nation had broken God's covenant and now faced his just punishment. Moses told the people he would again make his way back up to the Lord. He would ascend the mountain once more on behalf of the nation. There he would seek to make an atonement for their sin. By that, he probably meant simply that he would seek their forgiveness by appealing to God. At least that is what he proceeded to do. Atonement in its broader biblical and theological meaning refers to the removal or wiping away of sin through the offering of a, of a substitute. This idea was, fun, was, fun, was foundational to the Old Testament sin offering, which foreshadowed the offering of Christ as our substitute who put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9.26 Moses' desire was to save the people from God's judgment. However, he did not know to what extent this was possible, if at all, as indicated by his use of the word pre-adventure, meaning perhaps in Exodus 32.30. Moses then went back up the mountain into the presence of the Lord. He confessed what God already knew. The people had sinned greatly in making gods of gold, verse 31. Forgiveness sought. Exodus 32, 32. Moses asked the Lord to forgive the people. The earnestness of his plea is evident in the offer he made. If not, blot me out of thy book. How Moses' offer is understood depends on how we identify the book he mentions here. Many take this to be a reference to the book of life, which is mentioned in Philippians 4, 3, and a number of times in the book of Revelations 3, 5, 13, 8, 17, 8, 20, 12, 15, 21, 27. These references indicate the book of life contains the names of those who, who have or will receive eternal life. If, if this is what Moses was referring to, he was offering to be condemned eternally, blotted out of the book, if it meant Israel would be spared eternal judgment. Such an offer would indeed express an amazingly selfless love for his people. The Apostle Paul essentially expressed this very desire on behalf of his Jewish brethren in Romans 9, 1-3. While this interpretation is possible, it is pro probably best to take this book as relating to temporal life and not eternal life. To be blotted out of this book because of sin indicated an untimely death. In this case, Moses was suggesting that his life be taken in place of the people so that they would not be destroyed. Divine Declaration, verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book, verse 34. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Verse 35. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Accountability. Exodus 32, 33. The Lord's answer to Moses was straightforward. Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. This was essentially a statement of the divine principle of justice, namely that each person is responsible for his or her own sins and will suffer the just punishment for them. Only Christ could and did die for the sins of others. The man Moses could never do this. Those in Israel who had sinned would be blotted out of God's book. 
God knew each one's heart, and those who deserved his judgment would suffer physical death prematurely. Mercy, Exodus 32, 34a. While God could not accept Moses' selfless offer to be a substitute, his prayer for the people's forgiveness was answered. The Lord's mercy was evident in that he would allow the people to continue to the promised land under Moses' leadership as he had promised, 3, 8 through 10. Furthermore, the Lord reiterated his promise that, he, that his angel would go before them and give them victory, 23, 20 through 23. Discipline, Exodus 32, 34b through 35. Along with his mercy, however, God would also bring discipline. He declared that he would visit their sin upon them. This occurred through a plague he brought upon them specifically because of the golden calf that Aaron had made. We know neither the nature nor the extent of this plague, but at least some people suffered from it and presumably died. This plague served as a warning to all who would entertain ideas of idolatry in the future. There are several themes in this passage that bear contemplating. First, these final verses remind us that God is merciful and forgiving. Yet even when we confess our sins and receive his forgiveness, there may be serious temporal consequences for us. King David is a prime example. He was forgiven of his great sin, yet he had to deal with the consequences of it for many years in his own family. Forgiveness of sin is always available in Christ, but it is far better not to sin. Second, we are each responsible for our own sin. We cannot ignore it or cast the blame on someone else. Finally, a truly godly leader like Moses will confront sin, intercede for others, and call sinners to repentance. Questions. 1. What resulted from the Israelites' out-of-control behavior? 2. What tribe stood with Moses against the idolaters? 3. Why did the Lord demand that the idolaters be killed? Four, how many Israelites were killed? Five, what blessing did God bestow on the Levites? Six, why did Moses intercede for the people after the idolaters were killed? Seven, what offer did Moses make to the Lord? Eight, what book did Moses refer to and what did being blotted out of the book mean? Nine, how did the Lord answer Moses' plea on behalf of the people? Ten, how did the Lord express his mercy to Israel? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 15, 2020. Thank you for listening. God bless.